In this video, we're going to use economic theory to explain why cycles exist in the property market. Um, before watching this video, it'd be a good idea to have an understanding of how the cobweb model works. And so you can have a look. I have a video on the cobweb uh, model. Um, alternatively, there's loads of stuff on the internet you can have a look at before watching this video. Anyway, so let's start with what is a cycle because we're saying a cycle exists in the property market and that doesn't make sense unless you know what a cycle is and we're on the same page. So a cycle is a, a reoccurring um, fluctuation and this fluctuation is irregular in nature. So what we're saying is that it's a recurrent but irregular fluctuation in the total returns um, received from property. But this so-called recurrent but irregular, irregular fluctuation, which is a cycle, is also um, evident in a wide range of other factors such as development rates, vacancy rates, etc. And we know they exist because historical data has shown such fluctuations between total returns, we have seen it, um, but the structure and the nature of these fluctuations has changed every time, which is why we know they're irregular. An idealized property cycle, um, I, I think I have a video of this already, but basically how it goes is there tends to be growth, which leads to a lot of investment into the property market, which leads to an increase in supply until we reach a point where there's oversupply, which is then faced with market weakness because of the oversupply, nobody wants to invest in the property industry. This is then followed this weakness, we go down to recession and then we go down to the, the trough and then this is followed by a stabilization and recovery where some of the oversupply starts to be absorbed until we reach a point where there's a shortage and woo, demand is pushing up price and uh, investment growth comes into the market again and the cycle is back to where we started. So when we're looking to answer why do um, cyclical fluctuations occur, there's three key points we need to look at. Why are they triggered? How does the mechanism work? And finally, in the long run, where do cycles end or what is the trend like? So what triggers um, a cyclical fluctuation? Well, if you watch the cobweb, let's begin with, then you understand that fluctuations in prices are caused by people having naive and um, adaptive expectations where they base their future decisions on um, supply and demand based on past experiences. And so what triggers this initial disequilibrium um, can be anything. And these tend to be exogenous external factors. So example, like the main one is economic growth. You also have things like natural disaster, increase in price of crude oil, the electoral cycle, because remember, property industry is quite heavily regulated. So any government policy is likely to impact um, you know, what happens to supply and demand in the industry population, innovation, so things like new design uh, buildings, new trends, and also globalization. These are all factors which, in some way or another, they are causing the demand uh, the supply to contract or, um, you know, to increase. I don't want to say increase or decrease because, like you'll see in the cobweb video, it isn't the supply and demand which is shifting out, but rather we're moving along the curve because it isn't for the same price we can produce more or less. It's just that there are actual capacity and, and uh, curbs on you know the amount that is supplied. So for example, if we look at um, uh, say electoral policy and how does that impact? Well, you might say that there's new regulations coming in which are making it much harder to develop. And so, you know, supply will be um, cut at a certain point and so how does this actually feed into a trigger for a cycle well there's two key points because if um two key um, principles we'll look at but if, what we're trying to say is that if any of these factors was responded with a demand and supply uh you know of an equal scale um then that's all fine and the market equalizes but what we're saying is any initial change in any of these factors is resulting in an even bigger change of demand and supply and this is why for example when i gave the example earlier this is why growth it leads to an oversupply not just an increase in supply that matches growth and we can explain this using the two principles which is the accelerator principle and um, the multiplier effect so what the accelerator principle is saying is that any increase in national income um, results in a proportionally larger um, rise in investment so if growth say increases by 3%, then you're saying that actual property investment that has come as a result of that growth um, is much 
bigger and this assumes um, the capital output ratio is fixed i.e. so the amount of capital you need to make a certain output um, remains so let's try and understand this um, why why would this happen well essentially it comes back to the concept of derived demand so if there is a growth and the thing is property is a factor of production so if there's um, a growth then the demand for property is derived it's coming from you know this this need f of using property um you know to to build other goods and services so you have an accelerated um, effect that because demand for property is derived you have even greater um, you know, uh, demands for property, which leads to even greater investment in the property market than what the initial demand caused because of the way people are acting. And then conversely, so this is like basically the opposite of what we just said, which is a multiplier effect, which is then when the property industry spends money, this actually causes um, an even bigger increase. It's, it's a cycle. This causes an even bigger increase um, in economic growth through the multiplier effect. Now, I have a video called Circular Flow of Income, which basically explains that GDP is aggregate demand, and aggregate demand is demanded by uh, consumption, investment, etc. And what diagrammatically you can see is that. For example, to build those properties, then the um, you know construction teams are gonna uh, they're gonna need more raw materials. They're gonna employ more people. As a result of that, then you know business investment increases because oh, this is demand for property, more demand for raw materials. You're increasing employment. That increases consumption, which leads to an even further increase in aggregate demand. This is part of the Keynesian model of national income. So what let's get back to this is all very economical the principles we're talking about but what we're essentially saying is that there is a trigger of disequilibrium within the property market because of essentially some kind of exogenous factor and the reason why an exogenous factor like growth can cause or, or start or trigger this de disequilibrium is because of the accelerated principle multiplier principle which shows that you know there's an even bigger generation of either national income or property supply um, and so the market is not stabilizing it's not equi equilibrializing if that's the word I'm not sure but it's not reaching an equilibrium point then the second point is that after you have a triggered cycle how does the cycle work and this is where we talk about the cobweb model that um, supply is quite inelastic it's fixed for at any given point time in property it takes time to build a property and uh, and because of that what we see is these we call weak adjustment um, mechanism which means that the property market to adjust to a new equilibrium it takes a lot longer because their development lags their supply lags which means that you know going through the cycle is also much more slower getting through the cobweb is slower so reaching that long run equilibrium is even uh, even longer and the reason is to do with the price elasticity of supply that obviously supply is very inelastic to um, price as we were talking about the length of production also things like um, you know production is not just affected by the nature that you have to build but there's regulations like health and safety planning permission then there's also other factors you may not have thought about but property unlike I don't know say the market for hair bands there's a high sunk cost attached to it that you can't get back so making those decisions to increase supply they take a lot longer um, and also there's because there's also a substitute if you think about it to construction so that's the other reason that people might just want to adapt their buildings or overuse um, the slack space in the economy before you know there's any kind of real increase um, for demand or they decide to embark on these new um, uh, construction projects um, there's things like they may already have from the previous cycle projects in the pipeline um, and also the fact that a big player in the property market is banks and you know the nature is quite cyclical and okay say there's an exogenous demand trigger a lot more people their incomes rise they can save a lot more money and the bank is then a lot more willing to take on more risks and it's finding more properties um to spend money on and this is exacerbating the cycle because what normally would happen is the banks would increase their um loan to value ratio that they would lend to um builders builders would say great because the bank is taking on more risk than me and they'll be like fine we can take on more risky projects because 
we can get a bigger reward out of it. So it's a it's a kind of the cycle is exacerbated and it's made much more worse because they're weak adjustment mechanisms, just because of the nature of the industry, um, as it were. Um, and it's also this idea that um, the property industry, because it's so cyclical, a lot of people are new who in the peak times are recruited, you know, to deal with property. So they don't have much past experiences, um, you know, to help command and make them have a rational sense of what is, you know, more likely to be um, the real demand in the future. They're more optimistic. And then experienced people will say, well, I have to follow the herd because if I don't, then it's likely my bids to build certain construction projects will be rejected so I'm competing with you know a market mentality and finally I realize this video is getting long but the end of the cobweb because in the property market we look at a converging cycle where we're converging the price swings are getting smaller and smaller and um this is to do with the long run um, uh, sub uh, elasticity of supply of property. It's much more inelastic than demand and that's why it's a conversion. And the swings are getting less and less and eventually we should hopefully reach this um, equilibrium level. Um, but this is, you know, unlikely to ever translate to reality. There's always going to be some fluctuations, even if they're small. So cycles will always exist. And this is purely because of, as I said, the weak adjustment mechanisms that make property so unique. And this is what makes the cobweb model so important and, I guess, interesting. Thank you for watching.